A hand gently nudged Jazz from a deep slumber. Got a wakey wakey, Jasper, my boy. And he startled, waking Connie, who had drifted off with them. The Gersteins were nowhere to be seen, and G. William stood over here. You hearing me, Jazz? You awake? Jazz grumbled, sitting up and wiping an embarrassing string of drool from his chin. It hadn't been the usual dream, with the knife. It had been rusty this time. He blinked, bleary, sleep away. Gotta wakey. I'm awake. Is Howie? He's up in the ICU. Dr. Mogolov says no visitors tonight, but she's making an exception given the circumstances. Need to talk to the two of you. Put together some kind of timeline for what happened tonight. G. William checked his watch. Last night, technically. Connie disentangled herself from Jazz and stood up. Let's go. Sorry, G. William seemed genuinely apologetic. Family only back there. I got a need for Jazz, police business. But they won't let you in. Maybe tomorrow. Connie took that as well as she usually took someone telling her what she couldn't do. She crossed her arms over her chest and cocked her left hip in what she called her sassy stance and fixed the sheriff with a glare that Jazz knew all too well. He leapt up between them before Connie could start a fight. Con, it'll be okay. You should go home. Get some real rest. We'll both come back tomorrow to see Howie together. Okay? He's my friend, too, she said, her jaw set, her eyes flashing with anger. I know. He hugged her, even though she didn't open her arms to him. He held her off until she thawed, pecking him on the cheek and leaving without so much as a kind look in the sheriff's direction. G. William adjusted his hat and grinned. That one will keep you on the straight and narrow, Jasper Francis. Don't let her go. He clapped a hand on Jazz's shoulder and guided him through a door and down a corridor. The hospital was quiet, even the footfalls of nurses muffled by the gummy soles of their shoes. Jazz felt like he was walking down a dream hallway where sounds were not allowed to exist. Sounds and maybe the living. Breaking the unnerving silence, he said, I have to ask. This may seem stupid, but Jenny, Miss Davis, is she really? Sorry, Jazz. I know you tried your best, but yeah. Okay. I thought there was a chance maybe that I was wrong, that I didn't read her pulse right, or put your fingers right here and make sure, Jasper. Make damn sure, because the last thing you want is what's supposed to be a corpse getting up and telling the world what you've done. There was no chance, of course not, but he'd hoped. I want to wrap this up fast, G. William said, moving. I bet you're worried about your grandma, and I want to get you home to her. Grandma? In all the craziness, he'd forgotten about her. I completely lost track of time. He wasn't even sure what day it was or what year. Time had gone elastic and malleable and ductile. Nighttime was the worst time of day for a grandma but the Benadryl should have kept her knocked out. He hated imagining what she would do if she woke up alone. Anything was possible, really, up to and including deciding that he'd been abducted and launching her own version of a commando raid on the nearest house. Well, there was nothing to do about it for now. He had to help G. William, and then... Here we are, G. William said, gesturing to a door. Somehow it wasn't fair. Beyond that door lay Jazz's best friend in the world, the best friend he'd put in harm's way, the best friend he had nearly killed as easily as if he'd wielded the knife himself. Yet the door looked like every other door along the corridor. There was nothing special about it. And there should have been. You ready for this, G. William asked? Jazz wasn't, but he nodded anyway, and G. William pushed open the door. It wasn't nearly as bad as Jazz had feared. That said, it was still bad enough. If I didn't have bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all, Howie said as soon as he saw Jazz cracking a grin. It was Howie, and it wasn't Howie, all at once. His best friend lay in a hospital bed, covered to the chest with a blanket, so faded blue that it was almost white. Stick thin, Howie looked even thinner under that blanket a series of long wrinkles in the fabric that suggested a body more than revealed them. 
His skin was sallow, his eyes sunken above massive bags that drooped down like twin black eyes with something to prove. Bruises ran up and down both arms, radiating out from the points where tubes entered his body. The tubes. There were, Jazz counted, three of them. A saline drip for hydration. A line still transfusing blood, and a third one. Something else. Dinner time, Howie joked, pointing to one bag, as if he could read Jazz's confusion over the air like a radio transmission. Dextrose. Right. It had been hours since Howie had eaten, and he probably still wasn't up to taking solid food. What with the trauma, the anesthetics? A duo of wires also hung limp between connection points on Howie's chest and a heart monitor beside the bed. The monitor's EKG line loped along at a steady, slow 60 beats per minute. Tolerable. Apparently, Howie said jovially, he missed every vital organ and only nicked a blood vessel. You probably would have gotten up and chased the guy down. Me? I end up face down in my own blood. Three cheers for low clotting factor. Next time you get to be the one who gets stabbed. You weren't stabbed, Jazz said, after a moment's hesitation. You were slashed. They're different. Oh, okay, whatever. Howie grimaced as he adjusted his position. In bed, can we at least do some CSI mojo on my wound and figure out what kind of knife he used and then, like, track him down where he bought it and totally go SWAT style on his ass? G. William answered before Jazz could. Doesn't work like that, sorry. Slashing wounds don't, uh, betray any characteristic of the blade. Only stab wounds do that. If he'd stabbed you instead of slashing you, then maybe we could get some kind of forensic. G. William realized he was rambling and drifted off into silence, clearing his throat. He settled into a chair next to the bed. Anyway, the docs are saying you're going to be fine. Glad to hear it. Jazz still lingered by the door, unable to move closer. A crashing wave of guilt had broken over him as soon as he re recognized Howie in the bed, and the force of that wave kept him from approaching. Guilt. This kind of guilt, at least, was unfamiliar to him. Guilt for manipulating people? Sure, all the time. But he dismissed that guilt as a matter of course, as a cost of doing business. This was different. He'd almost gotten someone killed. He had gotten someone killed. Howie raised a hand, even though it clearly took effort and waved for Jazz to come closer. You gonna guard the door all night? Don't you want to see my stitches? They're gross, he said gross with a whisper of delight. Jazz went to the bed and stood opposite G. William. He had a powerful urge to touch Howie, almost to prove to himself that this paper-thin, transparent skin thing in bed was really his best friend and not a hallucination. Howie leaned as close as he could, given his weakness in the tubes. His voice, already weak, wasn't getting any stronger as he spoke. I have to own up, dog. You can't see the stitches yet. They're all still taped and gauzed. Jazz played along. Are you going to have a scar? Howie frowned. A little one. I wanted a nice big one, but no one asked me on account of me being unconscious at the time. Can you believe it? Bastards, Jazz intoned, and then he did it. He reached out and put his hand over Howie's, where it lay on top of the blanket. Something in that connection, something in that completed circuit, the taut vulnerability of Howie's skin, the reality of contact, something shattered a vessel deep inside Jazz, and he found himself speaking before he could think. It's all my fault, he whispered. It's my fault, she's dead. It's not. It is. You wanted to call G. William from the car. If we had... If we had, Howie's voice floated from the bed, weak but resolved, it would have gone down the same. Homeboy was already killing her. Howie's right, Jazz, G. William said gently. He rubbed his battered mass of a nose. If you'd called, we wouldn't have gotten there any faster, and in the meantime you made him deviate from his plan. You interrupted him. You scared him. He usually cuts the fingers off post-mortem, 
This time he cut them off while she was still alive. Oh, yay! The bitterness lay heavy on Jez's tongue. A victory for us. I'm sure Jenny will be glad to hear. Oh, wait, that's right. She's dead. G. William gave him a moment to indulge his anger and guilt, then cleared his throat. I need to know exactly what you guys did in Saul. Going to record this, okay? He brandished his smartphone and aimed the camera at them. They consented to being recorded, and Jazz pulled up a chair, sinking into it next to Howie, leaving one hand brushing against Howie's, as if to make sure his friend wasn't going anywhere. Between the two of them, they recounted the logic that had taken them to Jenny's apartment and what had happened afterward. Jazz surprised himself by recalling and describing Jenny's death in a voice entirely devoid of emotion. And as he recited the facts, he found those same facts bothering him less and less. Grief was replaced with anger. Anger at himself for failing, but also anger at the man impersonating his father. Called 911, how he's saying, and then I heard something in the alleyway. So I went back there and, how he coughed, and valiantly attacked his knife with my guts to no avail. Did you get a good look at him? Could you describe him? Howie smiled wanly. Yeah, he was about yay long. He held up his hands, four inches apart. Thin, made of steel, pointy, sharp. Jazz grinned despite himself. What about you, Jasper? Jazz shook his head. He'd been trying to recall the killer's face, his eyes, anything. But he'd had only the single instant before the man vanished through the window. Heading for street level and how he's got those blue eyes. All I can tell you is he's white, which I think we'd already assumed. Probably between 5'11 and 6'1-ish. He waggled a hand. Blue eyes. G. William thanked them and stood to leave, gesturing to Jazz that it was time for Howie to get some rest. But Jazz had to know. Did you guys find props in her apartment? The sheriff hesitated, then nodded. Yeah, a toe, toy, bow and arrow, and some other stuff. You know. During his phase as the artist, Billy had posed his victims. For his fourth victim, he'd posed her like Cupid, drawing a bow matching her initials VD to Valentine's Day. Billy's first dozen or so killings had all taken place before Jazz was born so he didn't know why Billy had done this. Probably one more in a highly successful string of distracting tactics, tactics that had kept the cops off his trail for decades. So I was right, Jazz said. Looks like it. Definitely mimicking Billy's career. What about the fingers? Cut them pre-mortem, not post, but you knew that already. We're not assuming this is a huge change in M.O., just that he heard you guys coming and had to move quickly. Quickly. No more than a minute had passed between Jazz pounding on and then crashing through the door. The impressionist had cut off Jenny's fingers in record time. Left the middle finger, as per usual. We found it under the sofa. Jazz wondered if he kicked it there when running into the room. You know what you have to do. He stared at G. William and did not let up. The sheriff didn't even need to consult his smartphone. Billy's next victim was named Isabella Hernandez. Maid at a hotel, 35. First thing in the morning, my crew is contacting every hotel in the area and asking if they have anyone with the initials IH working for them. Morning? What about now? If he's following Billy's pattern, we have three days before he takes his next victim. Better to let my people go at it in the light of day. What about the victims after her? You have the whole chronology of Billy's career. You can start looking for all of them, not just the next one. 